This is the video lecture for Lesson 8 in Clayton Croy's A Primer to Biblical Greek. In this lesson, we will provide an introduction to participles as well as the forms of the present participles. Participles are one of the more difficult concepts to grasp when learning Greek. And so I really encourage you to come back to this video at least a second or third time uh, until you have a good sense of what participles are, what they're doing, in addition to their distinctive forms. So let's do a brief review of the Greek parts of speech. Up to this point, we've basically learned about nouns, verbs, and adjectives. We started with verbs, and you'll remember that verbs have five components or five faces. They have tense, which denotes both time and aspect. They have voice, which is the relation of the subject to an action. They have mood, which is uh, the relationship between the action and reality. They have person, first, second, and third person, and they have number, singular or plural. You'll recall as well that when we learned about nouns, uh, there were certain components of nouns. Nouns can have gender, masculine, feminine, and neuter. They can have no, uh, number, uh, singular and plural, and they can have case, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, and vocative. And then finally, we learned about adjectives, which share those same components of nouns in the, in the sense of having gender and having number and having case. And we also learned that there are three types of adjectives, the attributive, the substantive, and the predicate. Now, those types of adjectives are going to be important for our use of participles. What are participles then? Well, a basic description or definition of participles is that they are verbal adjectives. So they are a combination, you might think, of verbs and adjectives. They are like verbs in the sense that they relate to action. They have both tense and voice. But they are like adjectives because they have gender, number, and case. And so uh, they have some major functions um, in a Greek sentence as well as in an English sentence. One is they may modify a verb. We would call this an adverbial participle. And so it tells us some action that is related to another verb. So it might be the circumstances of another verb would be one way to think of the adverbial participle. Then participles may modify a noun, and in this case, they are adjectival participles. And so just like an adjective, these provide us information about a noun or a pronoun. But in this, this case, participles are giving us some sort of information about what that noun is doing or being or saying. These would be examples of adjectival participles. So let's take a few examples from English um, because we do have participles in English. So to begin with an adverbial participle in English, I stayed up all night watching TV and checking my email. Now I've put watching and checking in red font because these are participles. They tell us about actions that are related to that main verb, which is underlined stayed up. So these participles communicate what I was doing while I was staying up all night. Um, so they're filling in information uh, uh, that is related to that main verb. Next, let's see an adjectival participle in English. I was not able to pay attention during the sermon because of that crying baby. Once again, crying is in red because it is an example of an English participle. The participle crying is modifying the noun baby. We could replace crying with any other adjective, big, loud, sad, happy. These would all be adjectives that are modifying baby. But in this case, crying is a verbal adjective. It's, it's telling us something about what that baby is doing. In this case, it's crying. We could also say sleeping or um, playing baby. These would all be other examples of English participles that have that adjectival function. What about Greek participles? There are different forms of Greek participles that are based on its verbal tendencies, first of all. So these will have tense, present, aorist, or perfect tense, and voice, active, middle, or passive voice. Greek participles can appear in all of those uh, differences and in different combinations of them. 
And it will also demonstrate adjectival tendencies. That is to say, it will have gender, number, and case. So what does that mean for you? It means that there are a lot of forms of participles. Fortunately, many of these forms resemble other nouns or adjective forms that we've previously learned. And so we're going to be looking for the endings and we're also going to be looking for distinctive infixes, um, little parts of words that have been put into a, a verbal form to indicate a participle. To begin with present active participles, a few thoughts or, or introductory words. First, the endings of the masculine and neuter forms of present active participles are like those of third declension nouns, which we just learned about in the past lecture. So think arhon, arhontas. The masculine and neuter participles have the infix ont, and you can see that already in ontas, except in the third plural that, that infix will not be present. And then the endings of feminine forms of present active participles will resemble first declension nouns like doxa or doxes. And so the feminine participles will have that inflic, infix us inside of it. Here are forms of the present active participle, masculine and neuter. And I've put that arhon, arhontas chart right there in the middle to remind you of the third declension nouns and how these present active participles in the masculine and in the neuter resemble those forms. So luon, luontas, luonti, luonta, luon. And you can see that um, as is the case with neuter nouns, the nominative, the accusative, and the vocative are all identical. But you can see how the antas, anti, anta endings, those are exactly the same as we would see in uh, arho, ar, arhon, arhonta, for example. Now we can add the feminine forms as well of the singular, and you see that inflix us there. So luusa, luuses, luuse, luusan, luusa. And so we have that inflex us, and then we have the endings that we would sort of expect with first declension noun. So you'll remember that doxa was one of those mixed forms of first declension nouns that begins with the alpha, then shifts to the eta in the genitive and dative, and then has the alpha show up again in the accusative. So um, again, looking for those key markers of the infix, the us, and then the endings is what's going to help us recognize participles. Here are the forms of the present active participle in the plural forms. And once again, luontes, that's exactly the sort of form that we would see with archontes, which is the, uh, the plural form of archon. And so luontes, luonton, luusin, luontas, luontes, um, has that ont um, infix throughout and then these endings that we've come to expect with third declension nouns. Um, similarly, luusai, luuson, luusais, luusas, luusai, these endings are identical to first declension noun endings for their plural forms and we have that consistent us uh, infix. So please beware, however, um, that luonta, which is um, can be either masculine singular accusative as we saw in the last chart, or it can be neuter plural nominative, neuter plural accusative, or neuter plural vocative, and only the context will tell you which form it is. Again, to start with the present middle participles, just some guiding principles as we did with the uh, present active participles. The endings of the masculine and neuter are identical to the second declension nouns. So think of logos or ergon. The endings of feminine forms are identical to first declension nouns. In this case, think about agape. And for all forms in the middle voice, there is an infix men. So again, here is this chart. And while you might get overwhelmed with these 15 forms, what you're really after is being able to distinguish the component parts that help you. So you can see the men infix throughout um, is indicating that we are, we are in the middle voice for this participle. You can see that 
Uh, we have a theme vowel, um, Omicron, that has been added uh, between the stem and that infix. And then those endings are identical to what we've seen with logos or agape or ergon. And so there's nothing terribly new here. It's just being combined. And it, now we have a verbal form rather than an adjective or a noun. Here is the plural form. Again, um, I, I really want to stress just being able to recognize the men infix and then the oi or the i or the a ah endings and uh, for all the different forms that we've become very accustomed to seeing with first and second declension nouns with the definite article and with adjectives. Finally, uh, let's discuss briefly the present participle of a me. Fortunately, what, what I really want to stress is that these are identical to the forms of the present active participle of luo without the stem lu. So you just get rid of lu and you have the forms of the present participle. So you see on, but it was lu on, which is what we are used to with that uh, masculine nominative singular participle. And then after that, antas, anti, anta, and so forth, we've simply gotten rid of that stem lu. And uh, as has been the case, the dative plural presents some problems, but hopefully not overwhelming problems as we saw with third declension nouns, the C or seen ending um, for the dative plural. Now we get uh, into some of the, the more com complex nature of participles. If all of those forms aren't overwhelming enough, uh, the syntax of the participle can actually be more tricky or more difficult. And really what you need to know in advance is it will get better with time. It will get easier and uh, simpler for you to understand what's going on um, the more you work with participles. So um, as verbal adjectives, participles function like adjectives, as we've already said. And so they can be attributive, that would be that they are modifying a noun. They can be substantive. That would be they're taking the place of a noun. Or they can be predicate, which is they are renaming or asserting something about a noun. In this case, they're use, they would probably use a linking verb to be in the translation. So participles in the attributive and substantive positions take a definite article and have an adjectival function. They are modifying a noun, like we saw in those English examples earlier in the lecture. Participles in the predicate position, however, do not take a definite article, and they have an adverbial function. They are saying something about that main verb or another verb in the sentence. And finally, please note that tense, the tense of a participle, denotes the kind of action and it is non-temporal. So the present tense, for example, usually denotes action that is simultaneous with the main verb. It is linear or ongoing action, but it doesn't necessarily tell us anything about when it happened. So it's, it's non-temporal, but it's giving us something about the kind of action. So the present tense, once again, is usually action that is simultaneous with the main verb. So let's see a few examples of the Greek participles. First of all, the Greek attributive participle. Remember, the attributive is attributing something to a noun. It's modifying a noun. Ha pistion on air, or perhaps ha on air, ha pistion. You'll note, first of all, that both forms have the presence of the definite article before the participle. Uh, in the first one, ha pistion on air, the definite article um, uh, is before the participle, and the participle sort of is in between the definite article and the noun. Um, with a second example, ha on air, ha pistion, you see that both the noun and the participle have their own definite article. This participle modifies a noun, in this case, on air, and it agrees in gender, number, and case. Um, indicated in the second example, especially by the repetition of the definite article. So in this case, we would translate it something like the believing man or the man who believes. 
Um, generally speaking with participles, if you can make it into an ing verb, that is sort of a default way to translate it. It's totally acceptable. And you'll hear me make translations where I use the man who with that um, relative pronoun who um, because it's perhaps a little bit more idiomatic, but you will always be safe with the believing man or something like that. Okay, let's see an example of the substantive participle now. He baptizo mene, or if we wanted to see a different case, te baptizo mene. So once again, we see the presence of the definite article before the participle, usually. In this case, there is no noun, and so the participle is standing in the place of the noun. And so we see the men inflicts, which tells us that we are in the middle or passive voice. Um, and so this would be an example of the being baptized woman or to the being baptized woman, if we want to see the dative case. Um, or we might translate it as the woman who is being baptized or to the woman who is being baptized. Again, uh, we have to supply some things in English that are, that are implicit to the forms in Greek. All right, the final example is the pre predicate participle. We can see it in this sentence. Edomen ten gunaika estiusen artan. And so um, you'll notice that there is no definite article before the participle, which is sort of our dead giveaway that we have a predicate part, a, a part, participle in the predicate position. The participle modifies a noun, in this case gunaika, and it agrees in gender, number, and case. And so as a predicate participle, its chief function is to modify another verb, in this case, edomen. And so we would translate this as, we saw the woman eating bread. Um, and so a translation will be more nuanced or perhaps open to interpretation, especially with these adverbial participles. And so we might say, we saw the woman while she was eating bread. Um, and so we have to supply some English to bring out perhaps what the sense is in the Greek. Again, I just want to emphasize that these, tr these participles are going to seem strange at the beginning, but as we continue to work with them, uh, they will begin to make more and more sense. We're going to do two practice and review exercises for this lecture. Um, the first one is number one. Pistas mathetes on uk hamartano es tan kurian Ude dioko tus dikaius. And so we would do what we'd like to do to find the, fit, the simple sentence. And so, um, you know, we might uh, put a bracket around ace tan kurion. Uh, and uh, that's really kind of the only thing that we can get rid of. Um, but then we want to identify the participles, at least for this lecture. Um, and so you'll notice own right there is a present. Um, active or really because it's from a me uh, we would just say a present participle masculine singular nominative from a me and it's a predicate so it's modifying mathetes it agrees in gender number in case with mathetes but there is no definite article and so in this case uh, we are we are um, sort of led to believe that this is a predicate so it's telling us something about um, the occasion of the main verb um, in this case we have two main verbs harmartano and dioko um, which we'll translate in just a second but um, this would be an example of a predicate participle and so we would translate this as um, being a faithful disciple, I do not sin against the Lord, nor do I persecute the righteous. Or if you want a bit more nuanced translation, you might translate it as, since I am a faithful disciple, I do not sin against the Lord, nor do I persecute the righteous ones. All right. Number 14 from the practice and review exercises. Um, once again, we can start by finding the simple sentence. Um, so we could get rid of or put a bracket around pros, tas, diakamenas, adelphas. 
as well as hupo ton eusion because those are both particip or those are both prepositional phrases. Um, and so we would be left with angeloi and nenken artan. But we'd also want to identify our participles because that's what this lesson is all about. And so diakomenas, um, you can see I've tried to highlight its different parts. We see the men infix and the alpha sigma ending, which indicates that we are in the present passive participle and it's feminine, plural, and accusative. And here it is attributive and it's modifying Adel Fas. And so the dead giveaway here is the definite article tas, which is also feminine, plural, and accusative, um, and agrees with Adel Fas, which is also feminine, plural, accusative. And so from this, we would, we would then have enough uh, information to translate. And so a translation would be something like, um, angels brought bread to the sisters being persecuted by the authorities. And so all of that phrase, being persecuted by the authorities, um, modifies the noun sisters. And so that's why we can think of this as an attributive use of the participle. All right, that is the end of lesson 18. Um, again, this is a, a, an introduction to participles. We are going to continue to work with participles in future lectures and lessons, um, but this will give you a broad overview to participles and hopefully we will begin to add more nuance um, and complexity to the use of participles in Greek. Thank you for your attention.